Our headline today comes from the Washington Post. This is from uh, Michelle Singletary. Michelle's got some good news, guys, for people across the nation. The IRS has $1 billion in your 2020 tax refunds, but time is running out to collect it. The window to claim it uh, is the middle of next month, May 17th. Michelle writes, typically the IRS doesn't have to chase taxpayers to claim a refund like if you ever no 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 keep my money irs please keep it she says as soon as the filing season opens millions of americans submit their 1040s to collect what they're owed as of march 15th of this year the average refund was three thousand one hundred and nine dollars which is up six percent from the same period last year but there are always folks who never make it to the filing part There's so many people, OG, that haven't even filed their taxes because they know they were going to get a refund that they don't realize that uh, there's a billion dollars sitting out there. I was talking to a friend of a friend a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about their kid who is 20 something years old and kind of works some odd jobs, doesn't really have a full time you know, full time, you know, uh, 40 hour week deal, but still makes some money and gets paid. And, and I said, well, you know, he's under the limit. So we don't really file taxes for him. And I was thinking, why wouldn't you do that? I said, oh, it's all the paperwork and stuff. I said, well, even if you're single with no exemptions, you're getting some taxes withheld from your check every paycheck. Why would you not go even, you know, you're under the, you're under the taxable limit, whatever it is, $15,000 or $13,000. If you make that, you're getting all your federal taxes back. Why Why wouldn't you go file your 1040 easy form? You can do it for free on the IRS website or, or some of these other tax preparing websites if it's a simple tax form like we talked about a couple of weeks ago and you get your money back. Why would you not do that? And if you don't want the money, why not just... Just check the box that says apply it to next year. Like you can keep rolling it if you really feel benevolent to the IRS and you're like, listen, I just want to help out the national debt. I'm going to let them hold on to my money a little longer. I don't need it. You just check the box that says apply this to next year. And then you can keep doing that for a long time. I, I don't understand why you wouldn't do it. No, well, me neither. But, 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 but well, maybe I do. I mean, if I seek to understand, to, to go back to the beginning of what you said, people are like, oh, but the forms. And so I think about, the value of my time. And I think that is a worthy thing to think about, you know, what is my time worth? And cause, cause you see people pick up nickels, right? Who, who, who cuts coupons anymore? We haven't talked about any coupon cutting thing in forever because you're coupons, saving, but yeah, you're saving 30 oh, cents, God. 50 cents <laughs> coupons. We could have a whole episode just on that. We, we, we yeah. had John correct us on how I said Boise. Boise, yeah, right? What Sorry, it, it's Boise. Boise, Boise. No, did you go through puberty, ass. Boise, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> At the library, I pooed during my puberty. I don't know. I, I, I don't know, but. Uh, Yes. I mean, at some Sorry level, you've that. got to kind of weigh the you've got to weigh the 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 cost benefit of your time. But there's some other effects there. Like how does how does not file? I don't know the answer to this. How does not filing affect your reconciliation with Social Security, for example? You know, obviously you're still getting your W two. You're choosing not to file your tax return. Obviously, the Social Security Administration is getting it, but there's no. You know, there's no ability for you to reconcile that to make sure that what is being reported to the Social Security Administration is really what actually happened. Right. You know, to make sure that those numbers match, which could affect you down the line. And God forbid you actually owe money. Now you're in a bigger world of hurt. Right. Like If you don't file taxes and you owe money, there's penalties and interest and 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 failure to file penalties by not uh, filing your income taxes on time. And, you know. How do you know that you're not going to owe money if you don't file? I, it, uh, well, I didn't even think about all those ROIs. I mean, the, the just just the Social Security addition alone, depending on it, we can't project what our work history is going to be. Hopefully we earn more than some of those people that you're you're talking about that are early in their career. But that adds to it. But even without that, listen to this. Nationwide, the average midpoint for the unclaimed refunds for 2020 
$932. And she makes a great point here. She means half of those are higher than that, right? I mean, that is the median. So half are higher. And in two states, New York and Pennsylvania, if you're listening to us and you're there, the median is a little over a thousand dollars. So it's actually even higher. But let's say you're the median. How long, if it's your first time filling out a 1040 EZ, how long is this actually going to take? Oh my gosh. 15 so, minutes. Yeah, but let's give somebody the benefit of the doubt. Doubt. Let's say it takes two hours. You're still yeah. at five hundred dollars an hour. Oh, gee. <laughs> right, right. And and it's not like when you and Doug had to do your tax returns the first time when it was like stone and chisel and you know it was really kind of archaic. I thought you said now. we were stoned. I was like, well, how, were you there? <laughs> that how, also. How did you like, know? How did you know? <laughs> yeah, I was in the corner the whole time. <laughs> you know? Doritos all over. <laughs> You don't remember talking to me. It's Fritos. It was quite the quite the party, as I recall. You clearly don't. But with apps these days, you don't even have to type in your own stuff. I was talking to uh, I was talking to a client a couple of days ago about their 1099, which has the 1099 is the thing you get when you have like all of your stock trades and it aggregates all of your all of your uh, gains and losses, and you report those on your tax form if you have a regular non uh, retirement brokerage account. And I said, oh my gosh, how long did it take? Did you import it from Schwab? And he said, no, there's a code on the 1099. When you're on TurboTax, you like literally say, I got my 1099 from Schwab. Here's the code. It imports it automatically. It's incredible. You don't even have to, like, you don't even have to do it. You take a picture of it with your, you take a picture of your W-2 with your phone. It goes, is all this info correct? And you go, yes. Bing, you get your 900 bucks just like that. You know, my scanner to your point felt so lonely this year because of exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I got just stuff. being able to take pictures. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, two hours, three hours, my gosh. And if, if you're, if you're owed some money, go, go get your cash. And if you don't need it, send it to me. <laughs> Duh. I'm going to ask the, uh, the dumb question. Cause that's, the only reason you guys have me around here. That and your stunning good looks. Is the only reason you have money from the IRS not sent to you because you haven't completed that tax? Or is it possible that there's money out there owed to you because maybe you didn't do your taxes thoroughly enough and they, they only return to you what you, like based on how you filled out your tax form that year? I mean, that's a really good question. Obviously, the IRS Whoa. knows what your <laughs> what your tax information should be. It's like that, it's like that, uh, you know, that joke that was going around with the, with the, you know, the IRS guy going, you know, you need to do all this stuff. I don't know how to do it. How do I don't know if I did it right? It's like, well, we know, well, can you just tell me, no, you have to do it yeah. right. What if I get <laughs> it wrong? You. Yeah. <laughs> you know, then you go to jail. <laughs> like, it's like, well, so I would, I don't know the answer to this either. I don't, I don't know whether or not they would, you know, send you extra money if they said, well, guess what? You forgot to file this. I, let me put it this way. If you don't put a credit that you're entitled to, the IRS doesn't say like, we know that you have a kid. Right. You didn't put the credit for the kid on here. You, you're, you should get another 2000 bucks. They're not going to do that by any stretch. But but if you forget a W-2 or you forget a, that you had a job from you know January and February and forgot to include yeah. that, I think they'll send, you, uh, they'll send you an amended form. So they'll send you a letter in the mail. They never email and they never call. So you will never get an email from the IRS. You will never get a phone call from the IRS, period, full stop. They mail regular USPS mail, or they show up with guns at your front porch. Those are the only two interactions you can have with an IRS person. So oh, that's a <laughs> wide field goal between those two. <laughs> it is, but it, they don't send you an email letting you know they're coming, and they never call and say, if you send us a check for 5000 we promise not to show up next Tuesday. They will just show up. That's how they work. So, uh, but they will send you a form, Doug, to your point and say, we think that you did this incorrectly. If you agree with our, our calculation, sign here and send this form back. Uh, but they won't add credits, I, I don't think. I, I, I mean, because you're electing that you, uh, an affirmative election saying, I'm entitled mm -hmm. this because of these circumstances. I wanted to start there because that's free money on the table, possibly for f some of our stackers or maybe the kids or some of our stackers who might have thought, you know what, it might not be worth the time. Probably is worth the time. 
But for all of our stackers, at one point or another, hopefully, fingers crossed, you come across a windfall. And certainly, a lot of people treat a tax refund as a windfall. Not truly a windfall. It's your money that you let the IRS hang on to. But you treat it as this time when, when it's money that comes out of the air and I can just blow this money. So I wanted to transition into this, which is kind of our standard operating procedure for what's our order of operations when we think about using uh, using a tax refund well. I think this is a great time, car, OG, to... Timeshare. <laughs> something with payments. Big screen TV. If you start off... Yes. Does it have payments? Yes, no. If, if yes, <laughs> if keep yes, going. Continue. Yes. Uh, uh, can, I, can I rent a sofa with this money? <laughs> How many months of TV payments is this? Well, and I think that's funny because that was, OG, oh, exactly where, where I'm going. In my order of operations, in my head, if I can use this to pay down some debt, that's probably job one of what I do with my tax refund. Yeah, I mean, 100%. If you've got the opportunity to, uh, if, if you've overpaid, overwithheld in your taxes, it's not, or it's, not or it's not necessarily the government's money. It's probably your money. Uh, unless again, back to the credit thing, in which case, you know, you should calculate that ahead of time and adjust your withholdings, but, but you get some money. Uh, obviously we want to use it for the best purposes possible debt pay down. If you have credit card consumer debt, which right now is averaging 24% interest is a pretty good place, pretty good ROI on that cash. Um, if, if you have some outstanding things, it's not, it's not fun. What about mortgage debt? What about if, if I get a mortgage at three and a half percent? Yeah, I mean, it depends on your goals. I, what I like to do is any found money, and technically I would count this as found money, even though it's not really found, right? You didn't get a surprise bonus at work. You, you know, you didn't inherit some money from somebody. Um, this is still your cash, but it's, you know, it's out of your budget. It's out of your cash flow. I decide in advance at the beginning of the year how I want to split up found money for the rest of the year. And I, and I put it in three different buckets. I either save it for something in the future, I spend it on something fun today, or I use it for debt pay down to aggressively pay down something like a mortgage. And so the yeah. way that we think about it is split those percentages in your mind in advance. For us, we do 40% toward the mortgage pay down. We put 40% in our investing account and 20% we blow on whatever we feel like, you know, whether it's a vacation or the new microwave that we need or something, you know, like whatever we can just write a check for and be okay with. And we decide that in advance because then there's not that decision fatigue of every single time you have an extra 500 bucks or extra thousand bucks or extra, you know, tax refund of $5,200 or whatever. You've already decided in advance where that money's going to go. You get the surprise bonus in August. You, had to, you know, you close the deal and the boss says, here, good job. Here's 20 grand. You don't have to like go, oh my gosh, how do I want to spend this? You go, oh, it's real simple 40, 40, 20 or 50. 40, 10, or like whatever, however you want to do it for you and your, and your family's goals. And it makes it super simple. Is it soup? Is it really efficient to pay off a mortgage at 3% when you could invest some money? No, it's not. It's not, but that's not my goal right now. My goal is to aggressively pay down my house, regardless of the interest rate, but I don't want to do it at the expense of other things either. I want to put all of my money on my house, pay down and then be ticked off. I don't have any vacation money. Or never saved a dime for retirement. Yeah, or wishing I would have invested some. You know, we just picked yeah. that forty forty twenty thing because that works for us, and 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 it allows us to to make the decision one time at the beginning of the year, apply it to every other found money scenario, and um, uh, and have no no regrets. It's a tattoo I've got. <laughs> I do love. I love the idea of the 20 in there, even though it's not 100% optimized, because what what I found, OG, and I don't know if your experience is the same, if you don't have this valve um, where where you can have a little fun with that money, like people that over-optimize end up making really dumb decisions later on. Like I found that people, when they first start off with their financial plan, they get super excited and they're 100% ramen noodles, ramen noodles, ramen noodles. And then they make a really dumb decision because, you know, at, at some point you're like, oh, I'm sick of this. I need a boat. I deserve. Yes. Instead of doing something a little bit stupid with the money, you do something really, really dumb. 
there's a combination with that 20% OG that I, that I, that I kind of like because it's appreciative and depending on how you use it, it's, it, it can be fun. Like if there's something to upgrade your home or home maintenance thing now, now nobody goes, Ooh, look at the new roof. Ooh, <laughs> looks look exactly like the old one. Uh, that always sucks. Or like the driveway repair that I've got coming, um, that's that's also stinks, but if there's some home maintenance thing you can do uh, that you've maybe been putting off that will make your life better when you're around your house and make your house worth more money, I think that's a great use of money. I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people over the last twenty five, twenty six years now, but over you know over the over, over the last several years where one of their financial goals is you know, a house remodel, a kitchen redo, you know, something like that, right? Hey, we've been here for 20 years. We want to, we want to paint the house. We want to, you know, refinish the floors or whatever. And you, okay, how much does it cost? It's going to be, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. And how are we going to pay for it? And we figure all that out. And then a year later, I go, Hey, how'd the house remodel go? Yeah, we didn't do it. Why? Right. That's so much money. It's like, who get? I mean, we've figured this all out from your financial plan. You've, you're on track for retirement. Your kids are going to college. You've done all the vacations you want. Paint the freaking house, man. Like, love where you are. Do your thing. And and then it piles up. It was funny. When we moved from Michigan to uh, uh, to, to Dallas, we had lived in our house for 10 years. And at the, uh, at the request of our realtor, he said, you know what would really make this thing pop would be if you repainted everything. It will, it'll look brand new. I mean, the house was only 10 years old to begin with, but it will really shine. We painted it. We fixed everything up. We fixed the carpet that was ripped. We did all the stuff, you know. Put put all this money into it. We're like, going, this is a pretty nice place after all. <laughs> what are we doing? Why didn't we do this stuff like five years ago? We did. We could have enjoyed thing. this. You know, we could have enjoyed this. Um, so when we moved to our house here, that was one of the things. Lisa and I talked about was, you know, hey, if we don't have a pool, we're getting a pool. I don't want to be here for ten years and be like, man, you know, it'd be great if we could save the money to get a pool. You know, like dig the hole, fill it with water. We'll figure out how to, how to, how to, you know, make it work in the budget. And, and, um, you know, so I think that to your point, it gives you that relief valve, but it also has a forcing mechanism. And look, it doesn't have to be 20%. You could say, I only want to invest 10% of my found money and I only want to put 10% of my found money on my debt payoff and I want to blow 80%. Sweet, man, you do you. I think the important thing is to make the decision once and then apply it to everything from here on out. And then, you know, after a year or two of doing that, then adjust it and see, hey, does this work for us? Are we accomplishing the things that we want to accomplish, you know, and enjoying it along the way? There's one more good use of money, I think, that is also a, a, a spend it on something rather than invest it. And that, and that is spending it on things that would increase your income. I know people talk about, oh, gee, the side hustle and how excited they'd be to, to get the side hustle finally moving or, or do something that would increase their career prospects. Like I consider that expense. Also, it can be fun, but also can be additive as well. Yeah. I mean, again, back to fun slash, you know, investing slash, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, a great example of this is a, you know, a vacation home that you rent out on Airbnb when you're not there or something like that. You know, you save the money up, you can turn this into a multi, you know, a multi-use type of expense. You know, it doesn't mean that it's going to necessarily make money, but maybe it helps you break even, or maybe it covers some of the cost you've been waiting. You've been thinking about, you know, getting into real estate investing, or you've been, um, uh, to your point about the house, like trying to invest in something that's going to uh, add some value, add some equity. That's another piece of this, I think, which is really interesting. People get so hung up on this sort of stuff. It's literally just moving one bucket from one, you know, money from one bucket to another. If you, if you ran a balance sheet of your, of your life, right, of your net worth, which is all of your assets and all of your liabilities, right? Those things equal your net worth. And then, and then you say, well, I'm going to take $20,000 out of my investment account and buy a, a rental property. And you've, you've figured out all the math and you think it's going to cash flow even money. You're not going to make any money. You're not going to lose any money. Well, what happens? You have $20,000 less dollars in cash and $20,000 more dollars in real estate equity now. <laughs> it's like the same, the same outcome in your, in your net worth. And yet we get so hung up on on you know investing in something that is 
appreciative or accretive to your to your overall financial financial uh, uh, status. Um, it's not as diversified, clearly, but but it's the same. You know, it's kind of the same thing. So, but still, it's an asset happy. that better meets your goals. And yeah, if and, it is, I mean, yeah, be, if you're, it, I mean. God, Lee, if you had 20 years with your kids and you're like, we should have a lake house, we should have a lake house, we should have a lake house. And then in the 19th year, you finally get one. You're going to be like, dang it. <laughs> I wish I'd have done this 10 years ago. Assuming you had the money, right? It's like, just do it. Have fun. I never once, I never once met somebody who says, you know what? I should have waited longer. Never. When it comes to, you know, investing or kind of improving their, improving the, the, the lives of the people around them. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 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 Never. Oh, I wish I would have waited another five years on that decision that I procrastinated on. Yeah. Well, just, yeah, that's true. just, just doesn't do I'm sure it. Sure. Glad I waited until I was 40 the, to max out my 401k. Right. The regrets always in the, in the, in the other, the other direction. No regrets. <laughs>